In the previous two episodes, we welcome guests from academia, federal agencies, and an association representing various industry, technology, and telecommunication interests. We examine the effectiveness and maturity level of V2X technology. We also discussed our current self-made regulatory mess and the obstacles it created for V2X deployment. Today, we are going to hear perspectives from the states, which have been heavily investing and in preparing the infrastructure for the arrival of connected vehicles and how states are affected by the FCC's regulatory actions. My first guest today is Director Scott Marler. Scott became the Director of the Iowa Department of Transportation in February 2020. Scott has worked for the Iowa DOT for over 23 years with experience in traffic operations, ITS, highway project development, regulatory compliance, and the natural environment. Scott has been active in leadership development and workforce planning and is instrumental in preparing for automated transportation and advanced technologies. Scott is a leader with the American Association of State Transportation Officials, AASHTO, where he currently serves on the Board of Directors, the Chair of the Committee on Transportation System Operations, and Co-Chair of the Cooperative Automated Transportation Coalition. Scott holds a Master's of Science degree from Miami University and a Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Southern Mississippi. Scott, welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Member Graham. We also want to thank the entire NTSB team for today's interview. On behalf of the American Association of State Transportation Officials, it's our honor to be here with you today. Great. Well, let's just jump in right away here. I know for many years, state DOTs across the country have been preparing for the arrival of V2X capable vehicles. Our Office of Highway Safety frequently references highway standards developed by AASHTO, but your association also represents all 50 state DOTs, including DC and Puerto Rico. Can you provide a broad nationwide overview of the activities that state DOTs have conducted over the last decade regarding V2X and tell us why the states are investing in this technology. I would love to. Let me start by sharing why DOTs are interested in V2X technology in the first place. Studies have shown that 94% of crashes are attributable in some way to human error or human choice. These types of advanced technologies like V2X collectively hold the potential to reduce crashes by as much as 80%. We're not aware of any other approaches that even come close to the promise of these types of technologies. AASHTO fully expects that V2X and connected vehicle technologies will continue to evolve, but that connectivity is a critical part of any future transportation framework. For several decades now, the state DOTs and AASHTO have been very active in V2X and connected vehicle uh, space. One of our key activities has been something called the Cooperative Automated Transportation Coalition, or the CAT Coalition. Uh, the predecessor to this coalition was formed originally in 2005, and we began meeting regularly to provide policy-level leadership. There have been many cross-sector communications, engagements, mutual learnings, particularly through AASHTO uh, national committees, like the Committee on Transportation System Operations. There, are, there have also been many state level proof of concepts or pilot projects. Uh, these have been occurring in test beds across the nation. And also a lot of states have pooled their funds together, something we call pool, pooled fund initiatives, uh, really to research some key questions of the day. State and local connected vehicle research efforts have been constrained by uncertainty. And this has certainly had effect on the research we've been doing across the nation. Uncertainty from manufacturers, which in part has resulted from uncertainty by the USDOT in not requiring connected vehicle technology. And finally, Member Graham, the FCC's recent actions regarding the 5.9 gigahertz safety ban has further added to that uncertainty among the states and the stakeholders in the trans transportation industry. Great, thank you for that. Let's talk about the research that some state DOTs have conducted. Who are the typical research partners and what kind of V2X research is typically supported by state DOTs, such as research related to traffic flow or imminent 
imminent crash prevention? And what kind of benefits do state DOT, DOTs expect to obtain with V2X technology? Yeah, thank you for that question. Let me, let me start by touching on the benefits, then I'll go right into some of the initiatives that have been going on. The V2X and connected vehicle technologies can, can help ve vehicles literally see around curves, see over hills, see beyond large vehicles or obstructions ahead, uh, see more clearly in inclement weather. We need the vehicles of the future to perform beyond a person's range of perception, better than what humans can do today. Doing so will lead to travel that is much safer and much more efficient. And we also believe in Ashto and among our member states that something we call connected autonomy is very important. These are technologies that are both automated vehicle and connected vehicle. These will provide the optimal safety and mobility benefits in our view. So here's some of the activities that the state DOTs have been engaged in around the country. We've really been uh, developing proofs of concepts and pilots for vehicle to infrastructure applications focused primarily on collision avoidance. So think about red light warning violations at intersections, end of queue warnings, uh, work zones, curve speed warnings, uh, spot weather warnings, such as if there's heavy fog. It's not unusual at all for states to be working with their university and local industry partners on these research projects. Collaboration for us has been more than just a word. It has underscored uh, the, the approaches that we take to solving some of the technical challenges, as well as the culture that we're going for. Through the Federal Highway Administration, the states have been monitoring three connected vehicle pilots for lessons learned. They were occurring in Wyoming, in New York City, and in the Tampa Hillsboro Expressway area of Florida. And I would, I would also say that the states have largely been interested in leading by example to show and demonstrate the commitment to these advanced technologies. And let me just highlight, Member Graham, let me highlight two of the uh, key examples that I'm talking about. One of them is called the SPAT challenge. SPAT stands for signal, phase, and timing. And the idea is that we want to equip 20 intersections in 20 states by 2020, a goal which we met. And the whole purpose is to see what we can learn. Another example that the states have been engaged with is what we call the Connected Fleet Challenge. This is where we equip a diverse uh, types of vehicles, particularly fleet vehicles like snow plows or buses with advanced communications technologies. Again, we're trying to gain experience and see what we can learn from these advanced technologies. Excellent, thank you for that. I would like to focus now on the instrumentation of the infrastructure. Do you have a sense of the extent of infrastructure V2X deployment across the country? Or maybe even some specific data, for example, the number of intersections and miles of roadways that have been instrumented by state and local DOTs for V2I capability? Right. Well, as infrastructure owners and operators, 34 of Ashto of Ashto's member DOTs hold active statewide dedicated short range communications or DSRC licenses. Uh, we also have four additional states having DSRC licenses at the local level. These licenses represent 57 different operational projects with more than 15,500 vehicles equipped with DSRC radios and nearly 6,200 roadside units. Uh, these deployments that I'm describing, they've been mapped out by USDOT in 2020. Additionally, there were 60, 66 projects that were in the works. These 66 projects represent an additional 3,400 vehicles and 1,900 roadside units. Wow, pretty extensive, I, I see. Can we hone in on one state that has particularly extensive uh, deployment? Can you discuss infrastructure instrumentation in one of, the, one of those such states? And not only in terms of numbers, but also the spread. Is, is the deployment localized in one or two urban areas or uh, widely uh, disseminated? Right. Well, let me touch on just a few examples to illustrate how, how the deployment is going in some of our states. So I'll, I'll highlight Utah to begin with. Utah has invested 2.3 million in DSRC over the past six years. Uh, they have another 15 million currently under contract for DSRC and cellular V2X uh, related applications. Looking ahead over the next two years, 
they want to invest 10 million more in communications technologies. So in the state of Utah, they've, they've deployed these technologies at 340 intersections in 267 vehicles using either DSRC, cellular V2X, or a combination of these technologies. And as I mentioned, they're looking ahead for the next two years. They want to deploy another 105 intersections and 290 vehicles over that time coming up. Utah's deployment in this example, it spans three counties and it, it includes urban arterials, rural roads, and Interstate 80 between Salt Lake City and Park City. Another example that I will mention is Tennessee. They've, they've spent nearly $5 million planning and designing uh, connected vehicle corridors. One example is the I-24 Smart Corridor. Another example is the Martin Luther King Smart Corridor. They've been looking at locations like Chattanooga, excuse me, Chattanooga, Franklin, Memphis, and Knoxville. Uh, there's deployments in California, in Florida, uh, the I-94 corridor in Michigan, the 33 Smart Mobility Corridor in Ohio. Yes, there have been significant investments across the country, and we're frankly excited about the benefits that these investments may yield. Excellent. That is a pretty wide deployment. I didn't think it was that expansive. What does it mean when we say instrumented intersection? Is it an intersection that has V2X radio installed, be it DSRC or LTE V2X, or an intersection that has V2X radio, but also multiple sensors and cameras to detect all non-connected roadway user users, such as pedestrians? I'm gonna say yes to all of the above. An instrumented intersection means many types of technologies may be in play at that intersection. When we talk about connected vehicle technology, there's certain types of um, underlying capabilities that we're really referring to, uh, such as SPAT information, signal phase and timing information. There's also a digital map with, that has specific information about the lane configuration. Uh, there's typically a V2I hub, uh, there are backhaul capabilities, and of course, there are some type of radio that would enable the communications. There are additional technologies being tested at intersections, such as cellular V2X, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. These are all technologies that are being tested among the states right now. Many signalized intersections also have technology that has nothing to do with connected vehicles, and these are necessary for normal traffic operations. You see them all the time in, in the signals you encounter on your way to and from school or work or home. Think detection loops, cameras, sonar and radar detectors. Of the more than 300,000 signalized intersections across our nation, the majority of them are not interconnected nor equipped with broader communications technology. Most, the vast majority operate within the confines of that intersection and the side streets that they serve. So some intersections are V2X equipped. A few have additional roadway detection sensors, but most have other non-V2X technologies. The vast majority of intersections do not have V2X radio, and they typically have some type of detection just locally for that intersection itself. Just a detection sensor locally then. Right. Oh, thank you for that, for clarifying that. Considering that states have been preparing the infrastructure for deployment of connected vehicles for many years, what can you say about the technology distribution? What proportion of infrastructure is instrumented with DS DSRC versus LTE V2X radios? Right. Well, as you said, the states indeed have been involved in the connected vehicle space for, for many years, and that's because the safety benefits are significant. And as I mentioned, the AASHTO members believe that connected autonomy is going to provide that optimal solution. The technology distribution is difficult to derive across the country, frankly, because states have many different initiatives and some of the pilots or demonstrations, they're being done under non-disclosure agreements with specific manufacturers. So let me share a little bit about uh, a perspective on just the spectrum itself. Until the FCC decision on the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, the FCC had only been granting DSRC operational licenses and cellular V2X experimental licenses. Nonetheless, as of November 2020, 15 states had obtained one of those cellular V2X experimental licenses from the FCC. 
Since the FCC's decision, some states have been planning to transition away from DSRC in the full safety spectrum, but that uncertainty remains. And one of the reasons that it's uncertain is because, for example, the Society of Automotive Engineers standard for cellular V2X is still pending in contrast to the fully approved standard for DSRC. Nonetheless, member Graham, Ashto is ultimately interested in the safe and efficient deployment of these connected vehicle technologies, not just the technology itself. Oh, understandable, thank you. The FCC recently shrunk the spectrum for V2X use to only 30 megahertz. And in our earlier segments, we discussed NHTSA's research on interference and its impact on V2X communication, forcing us to question the basic viability of the technology. But state DOTs are impacted beyond the interference problem. State DOTs have been deploying V2X in those other 45 megahertz as well. I'd like you to talk about the impact that this ruling has on state DOTs, but also to discuss the FCC's current proposed ruling to allocate the remaining 30 megahertz spectrum for use of only L LTE V2X devices and cease the use of DSRC. What is the combined impact of these FCC actions on state DOTs? The impact to the states, it's significant. But let me start by explaining a state perspective on spectrum and then I'll get into some of the specific impacts uh, of the FCC decision. This really goes back to our view of the surface transportation system and roadway vehicle, vehicle systems. In the old days, DOTs provided infrastructure, manufacturers provided vehicles, and drivers had to connect all the dots. Now we're looking at roadways, drivers, vehicles, and technology as one system particularly as human drivers are slowly augmented by more machine drivers. This allows us to think a little bit differently. Instead of humans connecting a bunch of systems, in the future, machines will do some of that for us. So I want to reflect on a famous American philosopher and conservationist. His name was Aldo Leopold. Mr. Leopold said to keep all the cogs and wheels is the first rule of intelligent tinkering. Ashto is interested in the safe and efficient deployment of these technologies, not just the technology itself. And the reason all 75 megahertz of the spectrum is important is because we need to keep all the cogs and wheels. We need to allow room for innovation. I'll uh, reflect on our transportation history right here in the United States. The father of modern public roads, Thomas McDonald, had a conversation with Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1938 regarding transcontinental highways. FDR had drawn in blue pencil a system of transcontinental highways that uh, he, would, he was interested in the nation developing. Thomas McDonald said, Mr. President, we do not envision this system of transcontinental highways to carry trucks coast to coast. Now let that soak in a minute, the words that Thomas McDonald shared with FDR. We do not envision transcontinental highways to carry trucks coast to coast. Imagine that for a moment, what are we not seeing today that will be needed for tomorrow? So not only do we need to keep all 75 megahertz available for the innovations of tomorrow, we need certainty that it will be there and will remain available for the industry to innovate. Now, let me shift the impact on the states of this decision. So the state DOTs, they've relied on the DSRC licenses granted by the FCC to make substantial investments in equipment and institutional capabilities. After the FCC reallocation of the spectrum, there are concerns whether this investment can be recouped, whether compensation can be made for the additional investment in new equipment and capabilities. The freeze on issuance of pending DSRC licenses has created yet more uncertainty and additional costs for advancing connected vehicle applications. Therefore, Ashto and our member states have advocated for the FCC to compensate or reimburse the state DOTs for immediate and future financial impacts. These include costs to vacate the lower 45 megahertz of the safety band, to restructure the upper 30 megahertz of the safety band, uh, to replace communications technology that we've been testing, uh, to develop and test uh, other applications that have so far been proving out the DSRC technology. 
And finally, our workforce to retain and retrain our workforce around these advanced technologies. Ashto's position is not just about the financial impacts. I want to make that clear. It's also critical to keep the spectrum available to allow for the life-saving innovations needed for trans transportation both today and also tomorrow. Thank you for that. Are you able to estimate the cost that over the years state DOTs have poured into development and deployment of V2X? The number is in the many tens of millions of dollars. As noted previously, Utah has already sunk more than 17 million currently. Uh, Florida, as part of their CAV program, has uh, 75 million invested. Tennessee has more than 5 million. And there's other examples where the states have invested significant sums on deployment of these connected vehicle technologies. Mm, wow. Well, I've, I've come to the end of my questions. Is there anything more you would like to add to our discussion today? Well, I want to say, Member Graham, how grateful we are for this conversation, because like the NTSB, Ashto members, we consider V2X and connected vehicle applications to be essential for improving traffic safety beyond what can be accomplished within vehicle systems and sensors alone. We know that the technologies will continue to evolve, that they will continue to develop, but connectivity, in our view, is a critical part of any future transportation framework. We also consider the reduced band of 30 megahertz to be insufficient capacity for V2X applications to operate. Therefore, we commend the NTSB for undertaking this series on where we are with these technologies and what needs to be done in the future. We want to move beyond our, as we, as we call them in Iowa, our silos of excellence. We wanna move beyond our silos of excellence and sub-optimization that we've seen among states and local jurisdictions. Frankly, we need a national vision and strategy so that everyone can understand where we are going in the future and can collaborate appropriately with manufacturers, developers, and the many partners in the transportation sector. Thank you, Member Graham and the entire NTSB team for the opportunity for ASHTO to help articulate the case for V2X and connected vehicle technologies. We look forward to more opportunities to collaborate in the future to improve traffic safety in our nation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director Scarp Marler. Uh, thank you for your time. And I appreciate all you're doing and uh, thank you for your insight on this important issue today. My pleasure. My second guest is John Hibbard. John is the Operations Division Director for Georgia's Department of Transportation. His responsibilities include the oversight and direction of the State Maintenance Office, the State Utilities Office, the Office of Traffic Operations, and the Office of Transportation Data. John's 35-year career includes stops at several consultancies as well as local government. John's a graduate of Georgia Tech with his bachelor's and master's in civil engineering. He is a registered PE in Georgia and directs Georgia DOT's implementation of connected vehicle technologies. John, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's good to be a, have the opportunity to be a part of this. So earlier in, in this episode, ASHTO provided a broad nationwide overview of V2X activities that states have taken over the last decade, including the extent of V2I deployment. But now let's take a micro view of one state's activity. Georgia has one of the most extensive V2I deployments. I'd like to explore the path that Georgia has taken and the impact that recent regulatory activities have had on your state. Let's start with research and pilot projects. Why has Georgia decided to start extensive instrumentation of infrastructure? And what kind of benefits do you expect from V2X deployment? I think that's a great question, and I think that our path is a pretty logical one that, that uh, we followed. Initially, we started as a consequence or in response to the ashto SPAT challenge, signal phasing and timing um, challenge that they issued in 2017-2018, uh, which was an encouragement to all states to implement um, v to i technologies at 20 intersections by 2020. We picked two corridors here in the Atlanta area that 
were logical in size and proximity. They totaled up to about 50 intersections. And we went down the path to install that technology at those locations. That effort generally, not perfectly, but generally went pretty smoothly. And we found ourselves um, up and running by mid 2018. So as we finished that pilot effort, where we were broadcasting signal phasing and timing information, we were broadcasting uh, green speed information, how fast you would have to go to get through the next traffic signal. And we were also broadcasting when it was likely that the vehicle was going to run a red light, to a, a, an early red light avoidance technology. Um, when we got done with that, we were all pleased with it being implemented and up and running. But our conclusion was that really 50 locations, 50 intersections, was really just a drop in the bucket. I mean, it's 50. Uh, Georgia, just as a point of reference, we have about 9,000 traffic signals over the entire state. We saw or perceived that we were part of a kind of a chicken and egg situation. Um, if we truly believe that there are benefits to, to the implementation of this VDI technology, and we do, the benefits, the, the principal and overarching benefits from our perspective are safety, uh, accident avoidance, accident minimization, perhaps, um, then the technology needs to be in vehicles and on the roadside. We already had a program up and running that provided pretty intensive traffic management for about 1,700 signals, all generally in Metro Atlanta. And most of those we had direct fiber optic communications with already in place. So with concurrence from our executive management, we set our target at installing the roadside part of V2I technology at those 1700 intersections. That was the initial goal. The 1700 was a known program. We can get our arms around it easily. We have relatively straightforward means of engaging contractors as need be to install the technology. Uh, and so that was the path we, we went down because we felt that we needed to send a message to the auto making side, the vehicle side of the industry, that there are agencies, the public agencies, the DOTs, that are, they are serious about this technology and willing to make that commitment to install it and potentially offering a place uh, as appropriate where they too could try and experience that technology on a relatively broad scale. Great, thank you for that. Can you provide some specifics on the deployment, as in the number of intersections and miles of roadway that have been instrumented in Georgia? Yes, glad to, because although our target for that effort was the 1700 intersections, to date, we have about 660 roadside units installed um, overwhelmingly in Metro Atlanta, though, uh, and those in Metro Atlanta are installed at, tra at existing traffic signals. We have about a dozen roadside units that are installed along a relatively rural section of Interstate 85 in West Central Georgia, uh, almost into Alabama. Um, most of what we've put in to date are DSRC communications type devices. Uh, to date, probably those there along I-85 are what we call dual mode and they, are, they have operated exclusively as CV to X um, devices since we put them in. Okay, so you got a, a large portion of your instrument, uh, your infrastructure is instrumented with mainly DSRC, but you do have some L LTE V2X uh, radios? We do, yes. Yeah, we do. Great. Um, does the instrumentation of the intersections include only equipping them with a radio, 
or are some of the intersections equipped with additional sensors and cameras to detect roadway users such as pedestrians? Um, as we made this decision to, to install at so many intersections, a, in addition to the benefits or the t goals that I described earlier, we also wanted to come away from this larger scale deployment um, getting, I'll say, really good, you can put that in quotes, so to speak, with the, with the infrastructure aspect of this technology so that we were able, that we could install it if need be, easily, reliably, that if we could be a resource to other agencies, um, with, whether that might be other states or maybe local agencies within Metro Atlanta, that, that we were confident enough of the lessons that we had learned to go forth and be useful, uh, a useful resource to them. So our focus has been on installing that roadside technology. The pedestrian aspect of it is critical, obviously, because pedestrian crashes are of, are of continued and increasing concern to us anyways. But the pedestrian aspect of this technological relationship has lagged. And so we have kept our focus on the vehicle part, recognizing that ultimately we needed to have that present, um, even as we contemplated addressing pedestrians and all other vulnerable road users. Great, thank you for that. So you have literally several hundreds of, in, several hundred intersections have been instrumented in Georgia. Considering that states are still waiting for the arrival of connected vehicles, what are the current benefits of deployment in these areas? I think that's it's a great question because ultimately, if you're going to deploy this technology right now, as immediate as you can, there need to be relatively immediate benefits. And the challenge with that overall safety goal that that we very much want to see and very much want to be a part of is that it that only occurs as the vehicle fleet and i'm speaking the big broad american vehicle fleet is implemented is equipped similarly so where we have placed our emphases and are receiving benefits from it are we have deployed within those 660, we have deployed what we call transit signal priority at about 30 of them uh, in, the in the tightest part of downtown Atlanta. Um, and we have outfitted express buses that are running routes from the suburbs into downtown. And we're struggling to maintain their schedule. They're, start they're having a hard time staying on schedule. So we installed this technology at the downtown signals. And the intent of this technology is if the bus is behind schedule and it can send a message saying that it's behind schedule, then we will work to turn the light green at, at, any, at any of these traffic signals, turn the light green a little bit earlier or let it stay green a little bit longer, all to the end of giving the bus a better chance of getting through the signal without being stopped. And we found that to be amazingly su successful. Uh, it, it, it's worked like a charm in getting buses back on schedule to the extent that we don't have to use this feature at all of the candidate signals. It only takes a few signals, they're back on schedule and they're good. Um, we've also implemented a close cousin of that concept in the vicinity of the port down in Savannah. Savannah's port uh, is a container port principally and is one of the top three in the country in terms of volume of containers uh, coming and going. It has struggles though because another part of a port is rail access trains and those uh, train tracks cross the entrance driveways, although they're massive driveways, to the port. And so we're able to use connected vehicle technology to know when the entrances are blocked, which ones are blocked, 
and transmit that information to trucks that are suitably equipped. And we've worked with trucking firms to do that um, so that we can tell that truck driver that gate number one is blocked. Consider using gate an alternate gate, of which there are several. They can choose several. They have choices. They just need to know that they need to make those choices. As well, we have also installed in those traffic signals that same sort of priority technology. If we can keep those trucks moving by turning the light green a little bit earlier or letting it stay green a little bit later, keeps the trucks moving, that's good for industry, but it keeps traffic moving, which is great for everybody on those roads. So good benefits there. We are just now, as, um, as part of a federal grant that we received from Federal Highways Administration, starting a project that will deploy the same technology, the same V to I technology on our HERO incident management motorist assist vehicles and on ambulances in Metro Atlanta so that they can get through traffic signals quicker. Um, they can get to, well, their destination, which could be a vehicle involved in a crash, or it could be the hospital, get there quicker and more reliably so they can do what they need to do. And we're very excited about that project as it just now is getting underway. Well, what, that's some great applications of this technology. Thanks for sharing that. Are all those instrumentations uh, performed under the umbrella of the state DOT de deployment, or do they include instrumentations by the local municipalities for the purpose of testing of automated vehicles or other reasons? Most of what I've described is, in, is, was installed by Georgia DOT. So many of those are at signals that are locally owned, but we have agreements in place with the local agencies to do those sorts of installations. Separate from really everything I've told you is yet another program where our Metro Planning Agency, the Atlanta Regional Commission, is working with local agencies to deploy this technology. Their goal within that endeavor is an additional 1,000 signals on top of the 1,700 I've already presented. Those locations of which only the very first few uh, have begun installation, those will be the first ones deployed overwhelmingly by local agencies for their use, frankly, as they see fit, whether that's to encourage AV testing or, um, or other applications that they see of benefit to their agency. Uh, one local government is um, contemplating putting this on their public works vehicles so that they can better know where those vehicles are and potentially transmit information to other motorists nearby that there may be a lane blocked due to some maintenance activity. Trying to provide that worker work zone awareness, which is another key element of crash experience and crash challenges uh, that we're experiencing here, much less nationally. Great, thank you for sharing that. As you're aware, uh, recently the FCC shrunk the spectrum to only 30 megahertz, informing those who have been using the other 45 megahertz to cease operations. In May, the FCC also published an NPRM to allocate the remaining 30 megahertz spectrum for the use of only LTE V2X devices and completely cease the use of DSRC. Earlier in this episode, we discussed with Ashto the broad implications of these rulemakings on state DOTs. Can you talk about how Georgia specifically is affected by these FCC actions? I'd be glad to, and I thank you very much for asking. I've, I've described it to some people, it's like a room that you might be accustomed to working in has just been made smaller. Um, and you have to learn how to accomplish your work within that smaller room. And another challenge that is a part and parcel of the FCC's decision is that if you continue with my room analogy, it's like your neighbors on either side of you might be really, really noisy. 
um, so much so that you may not be able to effectively work in that room. And that's interference. And that we can pull apart their action into several different pieces. And to me, that interference risk stands to be, it is the one least understood. And it is the one that frankly could make that remnant, that remaining 30 megahertz, essentially unusable at all. And that is a very disturbing and disappointing thought. The, 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 the move to change from, to essentially discontinue use of DSRC and move forward with the LTE CV to X technology. They're two technologies. They're, they're gonna function within the same space. Their intent is to do the same thing. Um, to me, the challenge is that the LTE technology is a newer technology and decisions that have been made concerning the DSRC technology, well, there are several of those decisions that just simply haven't been made yet concerning the um, LTE CV to X technology. They'll have to be made. I hope we can learn from the DSRC decision so that that, dis that process of, of developing that framework that it functions in will be a quicker and more efficient process, but nonetheless, that has to be made. What that's gonna force, to, force on Georgia DOT is all of those DSRC units will have to be replaced. There's a price tag on that. I mean, that's, that's a clear and simple one. Um, right now, frankly, it is very, very difficult to buy an LTE CV to X unit. This is not an issue of acceptability of the price. It is simply an issue of, can I get one? Um, so that is its own lurking challenge. We will have to spend money to redevelop to an extent the applications that we are currently running on DSRC so that they will run on CV to X. We don't have to redevelop them from scratch, but nonetheless, it is an effort it has a price tag on it. Um, and as I mentioned, the challenges with ordering the new technology, we have the decisions that fall to us that are truly financial and monetary, but we have this availability challenge, which, uh, which will continue to be a challenge as the FCC decision is pending the issuance of their last um, rule and order on this. And so consequently, you've got an industry that is just kind of sitting on weight. And so, okay, I can talk money, but every day, going back to that basic premise of why we are doing this, which is safety, Every day that this technology is not deployed, is not present, well then, there are crashes that are happening and people are injured or killed that could stand to be um, those accidents prevented, avoided through this technology, but it's not there. Well put, John. Thank you for that. Are you able, well, you're talking about costs. Are you able to estimate the cost that over the years that Georgia DOT has poured into development and deployment of V2X? We, we, ha we have. Uh, we, I, we have spent, um, it's, it is in the millions, um, in the vicinity of six to $10 million spent to date on that. Sadly, the cost to comply with the FCC's ruling um, won't be that number all over again, but it's um, far closer to that number than I wish it were. Interesting. Well, I've asked you a lot of questions um, and we're kind of closing down on the, this episode. Do you have anything else you'd like to add on this discussion? Well, I very much, again, am thankful for this opportunity and greatly appreciate um, your interest 
in this matter because, as I've said, this is a safety issue. This is a this was and is an opportunity to do something actively. Um, this is an opportunity that to enhance, increase safety, even as we struggle with increasing crash statistics broadly here in Georgia. Yes, but broadly nationally. Um, it's a chance for the U.S. to be a leader in this concept, even as other countries are making decisions. Um, and, and it is frustrating to see that leadership in a matter of kind of national pride um, stand to suffer. And that's, that's disappointing because so many countries look to the U.S. Uh, for how to, how to deal with big, how to make big decisions. But, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, uh, this is all a safety issue. And, and it was an opportunity to do a really good thing. But every day delayed, there is a, a horrible price that is being paid. I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. John, it's our pleasure. And uh, thank you for joining me today. And thank you for sharing what Georgia DOT is doing with this important safety issue. Again, thanks. States have been preparing for the arrival of V2X equipped vehicles for nearly a decade. Initially, states and local municipalities participated in pilot projects that tested the feasibility of the technology. As the benefits of V2X became clear, states took the next step and started equipping intersections and roads in anticipation of the soon-to-be-deployed V2X vehicles. As we heard from Director Scott Marler from AASHTO, 34 states are currently conducting 57 V2I deployment projects. These projects include more than 15,500 instrumented vehicles and 6,200 intersections and roadway segments. And USDOT has developed plans for an additional 66 such projects. As we heard from John Hibbert, the state of Georgia by itself has instrumented 660 intersections and roadway segments. The instrumentation and the research that states have conducted required considerable investment. States have spent well over $100 million expecting to obtain a safety benefit. That benefit can only be obtained with the deployment of V2X equipped vehicles. At the same time, the FCC's actions have had a severely negative impact on state DOTs. In our next episode, we will talk to vehicle manufacturers and discuss their reasons for delayed deployment of V2X equipped vehicles. Thank you for tuning in and please join us for the next episode.